My guest today is an accomplished writer, game designer, and illustrator. He is also the co-creator of Delta Green, the co-founder of Arc Dream Publishing, and was one of the original artists on Magic the Gathering. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. If you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Davids. I am the creator of the Books of Random Tables. Perhaps you've seen them on Amazon.com, on DriveThruRPG.com, or my website, DiceGeeks.com. If you are overwhelmed with Game Master Prep, my books are geared to help you cut that down. It is my mission to help Game Masters stay sane and have more fun at the table. Now, I have an amazing guest today, so I am not going to waste any more time. Here's the interview. My guest today is a writer, game designer, and illustrator. He is also the co-creator of Delta Green, as well as the co-founder of Arc Dream Publishing, among many other things in the gaming industry, Dennis Detweiler. Dennis, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I usually like to start off just by asking, when was the first time you played a tabletop role-playing game? Oh, uh, wow. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, 1981, I think. I'm old, so uh, I think it was the Mold Bay uh, box set, I think, or it might have been the red box set, uh, May or 82, maybe. Uh, but yeah, with, with a bunch of friends um, from school, we sat down and played Dungeons & Dragons, and I, I loved it. It was great. Yeah, well, I, I'm old as well, but I, 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 I try to pretend I'm not, but I give it away all the time on the show because I, I played my first time when I, in 1982 as well. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was about nine or so. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I think I was 10. And uh, yeah, it was, it was the year E.T. came out. So it was 82, I think. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I remember seeing D&D and E.T. and going, oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, seeing the box set and buying that. I forget what it cost, but... I saved all my money and bought it at some Borders books or something. And so uh, I guess your gaming didn't stop with Dungeons & Dragons, though. No, no, no. I, I was one of the... Well, I grew up uh, in New York. So I had um, wonderful access to a, an amazing store called The Complete Strategist. Uh, and, and this place is the gold mine of all tabletop RPG stores. It has, you know, I, would wa I wandered through it in the mid-90s uh, in college, and I found like a Gamma World box set from 1984 sealed <laughs> at the same price it was listed originally, and I bought it. You know, so I, I I got to see a lot of games: Call of Cthulhu, Traveler, God, you know, you name the game, uh, it was there, and we played everything. Uh, GURPS. Were you the game master often, or did you kind of switch back and forth being player and game master? Well, uh, we started where I was a player, but it very quickly became. Uh, force Dennis to game master all the time. Uh, <laughs> and that, and that, that trait continues to this day because I still play, we still play a weekly D&D game with my high school group and I am still the game master after all these years. Wow, you still have your high school group together? Yeah, yeah, we, we stopped for a long time and then we picked it back up uh, about two years ago, I guess, uh, via Roll20 and it's great, we love it. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, quite yeah. fun. I know a, a lot of people, of course, have played tabletop role-playing games over the years, but how then did they become your career? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I, uh, was, I went to college in New York City for illustration. I was drawing comic books for the big two back in the 90s. And then I got involved uh, with John Tynes. Uh, I discovered a copy of The Unspeakable Oath, which is a very weird, obscure little magazine for Call of Cthulhu, and I loved it. And... Uh, me and John became friends, and eventually I ended up becoming the art director there, and we created Delta Green together and a bunch of other things together. So that's kind of how I got into that. But then I went into video games for 15 years and um, helped create Magic the Gathering and all this other kind of crazy stuff. So um, only recently, only in the last, say, three years or four years, has um, tabletop role-playing games become my primary uh, job. 
there's a lot there and obviously um <laughs> you know kind of uh, glossing over uh, you know a little game like magic the gathering or something <laughs> 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 yeah uh, yeah I have interviewed uh, John Scott Tynes here on the podcast as well. Cool. And he, he talked about Unspeakable Oath and that song. Yeah. So that is interesting that you had uh, reached out to him and got involved with that. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was in um, New Brunswick, New Jersey with my girlfriend at the time. And we went into a gaming store and they had a copy of Unspeakable Oath number three, uh, which if you don't know the cover, it's three cultists who look like Uncle Fester holding machetes. And I was like, <laughs> I want to work for that. <laughs> um, and I, I just, I wrote him a letter. This is back before email. And, and he was like, oh, great. Yeah, we need all the help we can get. So suddenly I was drawing for that. It was great. It's just fantastic that you could just reach out, you know. Oh, yeah. It still goes on today. Like, yeah. it's like 90% of all the little gaming um, production groups I know began with, hey, I thought this was neat. Can I help you make something? And, you know, it's my number one recommendation for people trying to do this is find creative partners who face in the same direction as you and try and make stuff together. No, I think that's great advice. What, what do you think about all the, the kind of like the relative ease of self-publishing nowadays? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly easy. People, you know, I see a lot of, um, I see, I, I, there's a big split. The, the biggest problem I see is people compare tabletop role-playing game to publishing. It has nothing to do with conventional book publishing at all. Um, 100%. They're completely different. they they do not relate to one another. If you know how to get ahead in the Harper Collins crowd, you will know nothing about tabletop role-playing games. And if you are in tabletop role-playing games and you imagine a deal in the Harper Collins crowd, you will not understand anything about it. <laughs> Why do you uh, think that is? Well, uh, tabletop role-playing, there is literally no bar of entry. The, the bar of entry is, is actually negative now. <laughs> you, you can accidentally release a role-playing game <laughs> and have it be a hit. In conventional publishing, there are so many hoops to jump through and so many people who need to be fed along the chain that, you know, the, the pay is generally pretty bad and uh, for the amount of work put in. Mm -hmm. um, and contracts and such, you know, lead to a lot of problems. In tabletop role-playing games, we created Delta Green. Delta Green is ours. Uh, we have currently have multiple interested parties to produce video games and then uh, TV shows and things like that. Um, if we were in conventional publishing, that would never happen. Um, but TTRPG publishing is so easy to get into. You just have to be serious about it and keep working at it and keep releasing your work uh, and trying to improve. And uh, you can be, you can go from nobody to, you know, award winning author in a year if you really work at it. I absolutely agree because you're you're kind of describing you know my story a little bit because yeah. I was making some random tables. I decided to put them all together in a book and clean right. them up and release it, and it became a hit. So yeah, and, and here we are. That's, that's how that works, you know. And um, people, people, um, I, I've noticed a lot of people will go through a lot of hoops to pretend like some external force is keeping them from creating when it's truthfully they just kind of don't want to create. It's it's a lot of work and it can be discouraging and. You can make stuff that's not that great. You know, I, I, I make stuff that's not that great all the time and it's disappointing. So it's easier to kind of scapegoat it as if it's traditional publishing. Like, well, Wizards of the Coast won't publish my work. Who cares? Like, mm -hmm. it, it, this is the only industry you could be in where you will beat Wizards of the Coast for an any award at the end of the year and your odds are pretty good. You know, like we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we, you know, it's my entire company is me and Shane, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I, you know, I'm really excited by it. I think it's a great industry in so much, you know, where industry is held in quotes. It's not really an industry. It's just a bunch of people doing individual stuff. What would you say to somebody who's, you know, maybe they've been playing for a long time and they've had all these ideas and they, they kind of talk about publishing, but they they just don't. What would you say to them? Well, uh, you know, the biggest difference between um, the people I know who have done well in, in creating for TTRPG stuff, uh, you know, like, I, uh, I, I won't name names, uh, but the people who do well tend to focus and obsess about their work. They, they want to make something interesting and they want to finish it. Finishing is the hallmark of moving forward. If you can't finish something, no matter how small, no matter how good your ideas are or even your execution, it won't matter because no one will ever see it. Um, so my best advice for someone starting 
is pick a small project, finish it, get it out there, get feedback, listen to the feedback, uh, and you know, take in what you believe to be correct feedback and change over time. That's the most important thing. If you can do that, and you can do that over and over and over again without stopping, eventually you'll hit on something good. And um, you know, it's it's hard. It's never, you know, I I meet a lot of people who are like, I already released something on Drive Through RPG, and I'm like, okay, did I ever see it? No. You know, did you ever send it to anybody? No. You know, no one's buying it though. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I know you for years. You didn't even mention it on your Twitter. Well, I don't like to bother people with my products. Okay, like <laughs> I don't see how you think you're going to sell anything. People have to know it exists. You know. I like to tell people that it writing your thing, whatever it is, if it's a book or if it's, if it's even something small, creating it, self publishing it, that's twenty percent. Yeah, yeah. Eighty percent is marketing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you. You have to be willing to talk about this stuff. You have to have a thick skin because a lot of people are going to hate what you make. And if you can't handle that, you you know, don't do it. It's it's not worth it. It's just going to make you miserable. But for me, the way I look at it is I'm making stuff that me and Shane like and John Tynes and Scott Clancy and other people seem to like it too. And that's great. But I would still make this stuff <laughs> even if they weren't there. And I, in fact, I did while I was working full time in video games. I still made this other stuff, you know, the, these gaming books. It is one of those things. I You talk about criticism. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've been called everything from a scam artist to things I don't want to repeat. <laughs> and it's just like, I just have a book of random tables, man. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you don't like it. them, you know. <laughs> I get it too. I mean, Delta Green, like we, the first published Delta Green came out about a year before the X-Files. And all we ever hear about is, oh, you ripped off the X-Files. No. <laughs> no, we were there before the X-Files. The X-Files came along and probably helped us in retrospect. But no, we were doing all this well before that. And the X-Files hasn't even entered into our minds in this stuff. In fact, Glancy likes it, but I've always found it kind of goofy. So, and that upsets people. But, you know, we, that's an endless response. That's, and you just have to kind of go, okay, whatever, you know. Well, maybe we can talk about uh, Delta Green a little bit. Uh, what sure. were kind of the origins behind that? Well, um, not the X-Files. No, 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 definitely <laughs> not. John Tynes, uh, we got sick of, okay, so we, we used to play lots of Call of Cthulhu games, startlingly. <laughs> I know you're all shocked. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, shocked. We play Mask of Neurothotep, and uh, so many people would die during the game. So many characters would die that, that it, we just got completely bored with bringing in new characters and coming up with explanations. It was literally like, come on, waiter, let's go fight the dark cult. You know, we were literally <laughs> recruiting people off the street in Cairo to go, you know, and, and the waiter was like, sure, okay, that sounds great. And John got sick of that. So John, what John wanted was a, like a, a, an overarching reason to bring in new agents for these things. So he created Delta Green as kind of that in the modern Cthulhu. So, you know, your agent gets axed by, you know, the Haunter of the Dark. The agency sends in two more agents, right? And those are the new characters. No problem. So he created, the, he made up this name, Delta Green, and then wrote this scenario, uh, Convergence, I think it was called. And uh, I went nuts because I was a UFO head. I loved all things Roswell. Now you have to imagine this is 1991. So this this was outray stuff at the time. It was not part of the public discourse but in most of the places. You know, uh, in the fringe community, it was still very popular. But on TV on eight o'clock on a Friday night, you would not see a gray alien. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so I started writing all this crazy stuff about um, how the saucer that crashed in 47 was actually Amigo. Uh, device to test humanity's intelligence. It was filled with all these weird, you know, and he really liked that. So we started writing a big book called Delta Green. And then Scott Glancy, who was a law student uh, who loved the unspeakable oath was in Louisiana, I think at the time, uh, wrote us an entire historically researched Bible on government agencies with the mythos and just sent it to us in a binder. And we were like, this is the coolest thing we've ever seen. Like, you got to get out here, dude. But let's just all write this together. And we did. Yeah, that was, that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's just write this. Yeah. And then that, the, the original one, uh, that wasn't a complete system, correct? No, no. That, that yeah. was licensed um, through Chaosium. Um, but more recently, um, yeah. with, with the release of uh, Call of Cthulhu D20 and 
all that kind of stuff in the, in the, you know, Oh, it was a while ago. Now we kind of cut a deal with uh, Lynn Willis at Chaosium where, you know, it's its own thing and uh, the copyrights ours and, and, you know, that all worked out. Kind of then taking it and making it into its own system. I think you had what could be classed as an extremely successful Kickstarter, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> that changed my life, that Kickstarter. So yeah, it was, it was the reason I could step away from video games and end up where we are now and, and, kind of get myself out of a 15 year grind in video games, which, you know, to tell you the truth, sounds like a dream job, but it, it was awful. I hated it every minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I wouldn't have expected that, but. Uh... Well, you know, there were moments in there where things were cool, but um, the amount of struggle, uh, negotiation hours um, versus what I was paid mm-hmm. was never balanced. Uh, I literally lost years of my life struggling to make sure SpongeBob SquarePants launches properly on the iPad one, you know, and it's not something I would choose to repeat. So you were kind of able to make the leap into video games because of some of your work with like Unspeakable Oath and on that, or was that, did that come after? No, no, it had nothing to do with it. Um, I I was drawing, um, so I moved to Vancouver, BC with my wife and uh, I was drawing uh, something for Dark Horse Comics, I think, in in the coffee house. Uh, I don't recall what I was drawing, but a guy leaned over and said, "What did you? Is that like a photograph you're tracing or something?" I said, "No, this is a drawing." <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's kind of a thing to say. I literally, have an ink pen and I'm drawing on a pencil drawing, and he's like, <laughs> and then he was like, "Whoa, okay, well, you should come down and we'll talk." you do video games? I'm like, no, I've never done video games. He's like, well, come down to Radical Entertainment, which was this, the largest independent studio in Canada. Uh Down the block. (laughs) So the next day I went there and talked with a bunch of really cool people. And, and uh, the questions were like, well, you know, we need an art, uh, an art director. So what can you, and I'm like, well, I've done all this. And I did comic books. And I worked at Marvel and DC, you know, as a utility anchor and, and they were like Marvel. So they, it turns out, I didn't know at the time they were working on the incredible Hulk video game. So I immediately was hired. They were just like Marvel. Okay. Shit. Yeah, let's hire this guy. So they hired me. And then about a week into that, um, I had some feedback on the tuning of the game. They said, you know, how do you know how to design games? And I said, um, well, you know, I worked on this thing, magic, the gathering, and, and I don't know if you know what that is. And they were like, what? So within like 25 minutes after that, I was a game designer. And then I did that at Radical uh, for five years, six years. And, um, you know, I even got to launch my own AAA title for Activision called Prototype, which I created along with Eric Holmes. And that was a great achievement for something, for being in gaming for so short to actually release a, you know, a full on huge video game release for both uh, PlayStation and Xbox was an amazing thing, but it was, it was hell on me and very hard to complete. I think probably anybody who's listening, who is an artist is going to go to a coffee shop and put their work out <laughs> on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a lot of work that way, honestly. Now you, you covered a lot of things in there that hopefully I, we could touch on a little bit. So you sure. said you, you worked at DC and Marvel. Well, yeah, I, I did. Um, so I went to college at a place called School of Visual Arts mm-hmm. in New York, which is a very serious illustration-based school. Uh, one of my teachers was Will Eisner, to give you an idea of the kind of scale of the quality there. The, the artists who worked there, you know, uh, Perez and all these other guys who had done Marvel and DC Comics, and Will Eisner, who like literally invented the comic book, taught there. And, and before that, I had, I had had some contacts at Marvel. I followed a bunch of the Marvel artists around Manhattan when I was young and bothered them continuously, and they were kind enough. I, you know, I, I will say uh, Dave Mazzucchelli, uh, his wife was kind enough to make him be nice to me um, <laughs> when I was a little kid. And uh, this guy, Bob Budiansky, who um, created uh, Ghost Rider and did most of the Transformers comics in the 1980s, and you know, drew Webb as Spider-Man and such, became kind of a teacher and a mentor when I was about 15, 16. Um, so I ended up getting utility work, which means like I was just cleaning up inking work, which, you know, at the time was pretty fun and cool, but later on was kind of boring. 
Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I knew a bunch of the pros and basically their entire gist was uh, you have a scholarship to college, escape while you can. Don't, don't try and break into comic books. It's like trying to break into a death camp. <laughs> And they were all being laid off after, you know, 15 and 20 years at Marvel and DC at the time. The whole, the whole community was falling apart. Comics had gone through this huge resurgence in the early 80s and, and then just started to collapse yeah. uh, in the early 90s. So, I, you know, I followed their advice and I went to college and I met a bunch of really amazing comic book guys. And they all basically said, if you want to make money, do book covers. <laughs> so I, I started looking into that. How did you end up at Wizards of the Coast to work on uh, Magic the Gathering? Well, uh, that's, that's another interesting story. Jesper Mirfors, who was the art director, um, was a fan of the Unspeak Loath. Uh, so I hired him to do a bunch of illustrations for something called Devil's Children, I think. Um, and I also hired uh, Anson Maddox and Daniel Jellin, uh, other magic artists, uh, before there was magic, to do a bunch of stuff. Uh, Anson Maddox did the famous flesh book cover of unspeakable oath number 10 and Dan Jellin did a bunch of demons for the interior. Um, and then, um, all of our friends at wizards of the coast were just kind of friends. We knew Peter and Richard and they were just kind of goofy guys. We would see at conventions. Uh, they had no money, they had no backing. And, uh, eventually Jesper said, Oh, you want to paint these cards for this game? And I think I said, okay, (laughs) that was it. Um, you know, like that one decision, yeah. was the down payment for my condo in Vancouver. Just that. <laughs> um, so it changed my life. Um, and Richard and Peter Atkinson and Jesper Mirfors and Anson and Daniel, they're all just incredibly nice people. And that's kind of how I ended up doing the Wizards thing. Um, and I did that for a while. I think I drew their first product, which was a, a game book called Castle Sky. I'm not even sure it ever came out. Uh, so, I, you know, I'd had an in with them before when they were a tiny little company. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly they were this huge powerhouse um, yeah. that took over the industry. And I was I was kind of sitting on the rocket, which was nice. I got to go all over the world and sign magic cards. And that was awesome. Yeah, well, I can only imagine. I, I certainly remember when it came out. It was, uh, you know, well, I mean, talk about the definition of a game changer, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, it just was incredible. There for a while we thought, oh, well, tabletop role-playing games are going to go away. It'll be card games <laughs> and video games. Right? No, I mean, you know, Peter, Peter Atkinson is, is a, has a deep love of tabletop role-playing. So it was always his priority to go back there, but you know, to let you know how little all of us at wizards, uh, you know, our, all the wizards of the coast guys and, and all the freelancers for the art thought of this at the beginning, like we had no idea. So the first game ever played with real cards was unpacked in front of us at Origins in Texas, I think. It was me and John Tynes and Peter Atkinson and uh, Lisa Stevens. uh, And and they sat down to play this game and there had been a missorting in the cards. So all all the cards were impossible to get into play. Like it was all giant mana items. Um, So the game took forever and it was incredibly glacial and everybody was bored out of their minds. And I honestly remember thinking about two hours before seeing it, become a huge hit oh wow that was a waste of time i guess this game's not going to do anything it's kind of terrible just because it, the game wasn't playing properly and it, it just turned out to be a sorting error of lands versus cards and then within hours it was sold out at origins and people were literally having fist fights over cards um i can only imagine but uh yeah <laughs> a little no. startling. i'm sorry as i was just saying it, it was a little startling that whiplash of like wow that yeah i guess i should all those cards it was kind of a waste of time it's not going to sell to everybody needs these cards yeah and then yeah obviously it turned into a powerhouse and uh yes we are glad that uh, wizards of the coast had a commitment to tabletop role-playing games aren't we oh yeah <laughs> they've, they've done great and uh you know uh, it's one of the only company situations where everybody kind of when the company was purchased everybody cashed out and and was happy nobody was bitter nobody was upset and that, that was a beautiful thing so uh, and I still get royalties, oh, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, that is nice. So, uh, I mean, definitely those were a couple of things that I wanted to touch on there in your background. But, sure. of course, we we kind of dropped uh, Delta Green again. But just fairly recently, right, you created Delta Green to have its own 
kind of standalone system that you were mentioning. Yeah. Could you could you tell us more about like how that started to come about? Yeah, I mean, it just it just seemed uh, Call Cthulhu and, and Delta Green have been kind of going down different tracks for a long time, and, and Delta Green is about existential horror, and and you know we 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 really wanted to focus on the emotional damage caused by these things. And uh, we wanted that to be reflected mechanically and just felt like we needed to do something new about that. Um, so that was, that was the kind of the impetus to jump out there and do that. And, you know, uh, luckily we, we, thanks to Shane Ivy, we achieved what we were aiming for, which is the bond system and, you know, things like that being reflecting much more about uh, PTSD and, emotional damage over time when dealing with the unknown. So that's kind of why we did it. As I mentioned before, you you had an incredible Kickstarter for that and it kind of launched, you know, Delta Green into like a new orbit of, of its, you know, its own standalone thing. Just kind of thinking about that a little bit, like, I don't know if this is a little inside baseball or whatever, but for somebody who's not a game designer or whatever, what does that process kind of look like when you had to start, you know, building it up and putting the whole thing to its own system in that. That's pretty easy. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of testing. Let's just put it that way. That that's the hardest part is putting it out. What we wanted to do was we wanted um, to put a game system together that could do that, that, that could simplify and, and kind of streamline combat so that it felt much more conventionally real. Mm-hmm. And the way we did that was we added new mechanics uh, with Greg Stolte, like the lethality mechanic, we have in there, which changes the game completely. But um, the best part is when we put this in front of combat experienced U.S. Marines and Navy men, and their response was, this is the most accurate representation of what these things can do in a fight that we've seen in a game. Um, And they modified the rules. They helped us kind of tweak it. Um, So that was kind of the overarching goal. But as far as like creating a new game system, I forget which game system this was for us. This might've been the ninth game system we've created or I've been making game systems since I was a kid. And, and, you know, I think a lot of gamers are like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have this kind of intuitive feel of what you want to get out there. The key was getting it tested and getting it played and getting that feeling of dread and risk um, out of the game. That's really what we wanted is that you, you should feel like you're always on the edge of losing and if you can win, even for a, a moment, or all you're winning is a brief uh, respite. You know, you're not winning. You're not killing Cthulhu. You're not saving the world from the great old ones. You're putting the thing back behind the sigil where you know it'll wake up in another 60 years when it's someone else's problem. You know, that's your best victory. <laughs> uh, and we really want it dark and real. Oh, that's interesting. Now, I don't know if if you know about this, but I think I heard on a podcast that uh, a couple Delta green maps or something made their way into like some documentaries <laughs> on Netflix or something. That's endless. Um, that ha- that's been happening for a decade or more. Uh, I think it was Nazi gold or something like that. Uh, someone published one of our flat earth maps and then uh, not flat earth, hollow earth maps. And then, uh, or, or no, no, it was point one Oh three map. It was like a Antarctic base map, but you know, even worse, we made a, a New York Times bestseller nonfiction book. I don't know if you saw that. No. <laughs> so so uh, I think, I believe the book is called A Covert Affair, which is about Julia Childs and the OSS. And they, I, reference, they reference Delta Green as a non-fictional agency in it. <laughs> so, oh my uh, goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. And we wonder why uh, conspiracy theories and stuff like that are all around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was awesome. Someone was like, have you seen this? I think the best review was, I, I would give this one star, but I'm giving it four stars because it contains a fictional agency sent to hunt Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's great. Huh. <laughs> you think somebody would type in Delta Green into Google and find out before they published it, I guess. They, they, well, I think, I, I honestly think that's where they got the reference. Yeah, well, yeah. Because I I wrote a bunch of supplementary materials uh, for Denied to the Enemy, one of the one of the World War II fiction books, mm-hmm. which deals with Asian people of Burma and the war there uh, with the OSS. And I think they just searched and found a snippet from the book on Goodreads or, and just like, oh, well, I guess that's real. 
<laughs> just copy and paste. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally researched. New York Times bestseller. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I mean, it just adds to the mythos of your game, right? Yeah, oh, and the other one is re- Gaia. You know Gaia products on, on like Facebook? They're like yoga products. And oh, yeah. No, I don't know those. So there's this weird brand, and, and they publish things about like, you know, mystical chakras and the secret of Atlantis. And they publish, I forget, they swiped the Migo, I think, straight up. You know, gray aliens are not gray aliens. They're controlled by these fungal things from beyond Pluto. It was like word for word snatch from one of our books. And I believe we sent a C and D to them and they removed it. It's totally real. Yeah. (laughs) My goodness. But you had mentioned a little bit, you said that uh, Delta green had allowed you to kind of step away. Um, Yeah. So uh, are you like full-time Delta green stuff now? Oh yeah. Years now. So yeah. So for about 15 years, I was developing video games. I was moving. We were, me and my wife are Canadian and, and we wanted to move back to Canada. So I was aiming for that and it would have taken another five or six years, but the Kickstarter really kind of just cemented my, you know, if I create these books, I'll get this income mm-hmm. and the income's there. It's ready to go. I just need to make the books. So it made that possible. And, and it's proven so popular that it's not slowing down anytime soon. If anything, it's kind of sped up. So, so yeah, um, now I work full time on TTRPG Delta Green stuff with a couple side favors uh, for people like um, Spivey um, doing some work for him. And, and that's about it. I only work on stuff I really want to work on. Now, if somebody is unfamiliar with Delta Green, what would they need to get to uh, start playing? Uh, well, there, there is a, a singular free or pay what you want product on drive through RPG. But it's it's called um, it's called Delta Green Need to Know, and it's pay what you want. It won the Gold Any for best free game in 2016. Uh, if you get that, it's all the rules. It's six pre-made characters and a full-on scenario. So if you want to run it, that's all you need. Uh, you can get the PDF for free just by paying zero, and it'll tell you whether or not you're a Delta Green fan. People who like Delta Green, it, you know, it tends to be a very dark. Thing. It's all about sacrifice and attempting to kind of stave off darkness for another day. Um, but more often than not, it's the fun is in how did my agent get killed uh, during this operation? Was he disintegrated? Did he step through a mirror and go back in time 150 years? Uh, you know, the weird stuff happens in Delta Green. So it's, it's really fun. It's like you're playing in a horror movie. And, and we often have best death. Who died the best? <laughs> Uh, it, it's if you like that kind of stuff, you're going to love Delta Green. If you like horror movies, if you like uh, scary stuff, if you like spy based thrillers, put that all together and you'll love Delta Green. It's not for those role players who like will stick the tip of their sword through a, a door in a dungeon or something like that, you know, to make sure there's no traps before they, uh, because they're uh, yeah. so cautious. They don't want their character to die. I, I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of converts from, you know, who just haven't really experienced what it's like to play play this kind of Pyrrhic victory based game. And I've seen them come over from that kind of stuff. I love D and D five E I love heroic over the top adventure stuff. We're most definitely not aiming for that. The the truth is Delta green will never win. The great old ones will destroy humanity. It's all been preordained. And, you know, we're not even a moat (laughs) to them. We're not even a gnat. Um, And then we have no chance at victory, but the agents of Delta Green fight on despite this to, to just kind of offset these horrors moment to moment uh, in the hopes that they can hide the stuff for another day. And um, there's a joy in that and a, a real feeling of accomplishment. Even if you don't totally win, when you pull off a victory, it is the most amazing thing ever. When you manage to destroy the dark young or, you know, close the gate or, you know, and even an agent walks away. It's an amazing, we had a, we had a session where everybody died and a guy named uh, John Marin was playing a, a doctor who was seriously injured and knew there was a body in the morgue in the same hospital where he, she was being treated, the doctor, um, that contained horrible secrets that could not get out. And he had been, uh, his character, the, the woman had been shot and she struggled out of bed and made all these rolls to get downstairs with an IV to trundle this body into the incinerator before it could be discovered and then collapsed and nearly bled out. 
there and everybody at the table was clapping and screaming and make the roll, make the roll <laughs> because she completed her mission. And it sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but it was awesome. I think, I think the people at the table, Ken Height was there playing, you know, we just had an amazing group of players. Greg Stolte was there, wow. Shane, and it, it just, it was amazing. They had all died, <laughs> <laughs> but they were still there rooting for this one other person. That sounds awesome, actually. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great fun. You know, I'd ask you if somebody wasn't familiar with Delta Greens, but what if uh, somebody is out there and they're running some Delta Green? What are maybe a one key piece or two key pieces of advice for running kind of Delta Green adventures? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the two I always hit on is, is uh, uh, less is more. So the, the moments of true unadulterated cosmic horror should be few and far between. And when they occur, they should be life-changing. They should, your agent should never walk the same, you know? <laughs> and uh, the second I'll say is horror and, and the elements of horror are only horrific in comparison with the real world. So establishing a strong baseline of you are in the real world. You know, you walk into an area, Rush is playing on the radio of the car next to you. And the kids are running up and down the street, uh, you know, all wearing Knicks jerseys in the 94 degree heat. You want to describe it. You want to put these people in a scene so that when the monster from beyond space time shows up, it seems amazing and bizarre mm -hmm. in comparison to the real world. A lot of people I know gloss over the small stuff. The small stuff is a lot of, uh, is, is a lot of where I get joy in Delta green from, you know, um, we had a, an agent was obsessed with his Facebook and dealing with his wife and he forgot to turn off locations and he posted something and he's supposed to be on a training trip. That's, that was his lie. And it accidentally posted his location as like Missoula, Montana. And his wife then was calling him every hour screaming at him. Like, where are you? What's her name? And you know, <laughs> the agent was just completely flabbergasted that I recognized one that his character did that. I mean, he literally mentioned it and I was like, I'm going to use that later, <laughs> but it was great fun. Um, so little things like that in the real world uh, really set the scene for the horrific stuff to follow. No, oh, I think that's great advice. What about somebody who, who maybe they've run a lot of fantasy? What would you think uh, like a piece of advice would be for them now switching to run kind of modern day stuff? You know, like the, the, the best, quickest way would um, just watch the movie Sicario. <laughs> just it's it, it doesn't have a cult or well not it doesn't really have any occult or great old one stuff in it. But if you watch that, you get a good idea of kind of the feel of Delta Green. You know, it's groups within the federal government secretly doing stuff around other groups in the federal government who have no idea it's going on, and there's a dark enemy out there that you, you kind of have to deal with who are relentlessly violent and evil. Um, in that case, in Sicario, it's, you know, the, it's the cartels, but in our game, it's the, the great, the forces of the great old ones, these otherworldly horrors from beyond space time who are so far beyond human conception that you literally can't even look at them or go insane. I will, uh, along with, uh, the Delta Green need to know, I'll put a link to that movie in the show notes, cool. uh, for this episode. Yeah, it's probably, probably the simplest shortcut is kind of looking at that. Maybe too. You had mentioned you said you you still play it every week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were playing five e. Yep, we're playing five e. We're playing um, Shane Ivy created a bunch of uh, fifth edition products called Swords and Sorcery, the, and and it's kind of a dark um, Conan feel to the world. And we've been running that and been having great fun. And you said you were using Roll Twenty already for that. Yeah, yeah. Roll Twenty. I use Roll Twenty for Delta Green too. We have a Delta Green sheet on there. You can get. You can just choose it from the drop down. Mm -hmm. and uh, does all the rules and stuff. So, I guess, you know, as, as we're kind of closing out here, um, unless there was something that I missed that you wanted to tell somebody, you know, you wanted to tell the listeners about Delta Green or something. No, no, I just, um, my biggest thing is um, I update all my Delta Green work on Patreon. I would invite people to join my Patreon if they're interested in Delta Green. For example, the upcoming Delta Green campaign which is, I'm writing, which is called Impossible Landscapes that features the King Yellow. Uh, I released uh, the entire campaign in text on my Patreon. I think it's 158,000 words or something wow. like that. So you sign up for as little as a dollar and you gain access to all of that stuff. There's tons of monsters, 
tons of scenarios, tons of creature, uh, not creatures, magic, um, NPCs and fiction. So, uh, I'll give you the link afterwards. There's fiction as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. I write tons of Delta green fiction. So, uh, just, I think two years ago we released, um, a, a micro fiction book called, um, uh, the way it went down and that, that got nominated for an any, um, I've written two Delta green novels, a bunch of fiction anthologies, uh, John Tynes has written a novel or two novels, I think. And um, yeah, there's a bunch of short story anthologies that have always done really well. Um, they're all available on Drive Through RPG. Okay, great. Now you mentioned your Patreon, but where else can people uh, learn more about you and your work? Uh, Patreon is pretty much where I live and work. Um, or you can follow me on Twitter. Please note, I, I tend to be, uh, I, I'm a Canadian. So <laughs> by, by American... American political standards, I am so far left, you can't see me. Um, so if you show up spouting about some horrible thing, I'm going to just block you. And <laughs> it may seem funny I have to say this, but apparently I do because I occasionally will get spikes of 16 or 17 people following me and every one of them will start like, why do you hate President Trump? Block, 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 block. I don't argue anymore. I just block. I will put links to your Patreon, to the Delta Green Need to Know, and some other books, um, cool. and to your Twitter in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. So anybody who's listening can just head over to DiceGeeks.com, and they can check out the show notes, and they can uh, find out more about Delta Green and uh, see what you're up to on Patreon. Well, Dennis, it was a pleasure to speak with you today. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks very much for having me. All right, there you have it, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dennis today. It was an absolute pleasure getting to speak to him. As I mentioned during the episode, I have provided links in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. I have provided links to the Delta Green Need to Know, Delta Green Role Playing Game, in addition to some of the other games and books that Dennis has worked on. So if you want to check some of Dennis's work out, you can just head over to DiceGeeks.com, just find the show notes for this episode episode there and you will see those links. If you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And every Friday, you'll get an update from me letting you know what is going on here at Dice Geeks. If you enjoy this podcast, I could really use your help. I have a Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com slash dicegeeks. If you were to leave a review or a rating or to subscribe to the podcast, that would be incredible. Also, if you could just tell one of your friends about this podcast, that would be absolutely amazing. All of those things just help more people hear about the show and just lets me know that I should keep making these episodes each and every week. I thank you so much for listening today and until next time, keep gaming.